Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Without further ado, returning to The Invisible Man as read by Lord Naren White. Now, said the voice, as a third stone curved upward and hung in the air above the tramp. In my imagination, Mr. Marvel, Mr. Marvel, by way of reply, struggled to his feet and was immediately rolled over again. He lay for a quiet moment. If you struggle any more, said the voice, I shall throw your, I shall throw the flint at your head. It's a fair do, said Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand and fixing his eye on the third missile. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves? Stones talking? Put yourself down. Rot away. I'm done. The third flint fell. It's very simple, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Tell us something I don't know, said Mr. Marvel, gasping with pain. Where you've hid, how you... How you do it? I don't know. I'm beat. That's all, said the voice. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. A anyone could see that. Funny. That's me inter interjecting. That's pretty funny. Lord Gogan. Anyone could see that. There's no need for you to be so confounded, impatient, mister. Now then, give us a notion. How are you hid? I'm invisible. That's the great point. And I want, and what I want you to understand is this. But whereabouts? interrupted Mr. Marvel. Here, six yards in front of you. Oh, come, I ain't blind. You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I'm, I am, thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Vox et, what is it? Jabber, is, is it that? I am just a human being, solid, needing food and drink, needing covering too. But I'm invisible, you see? Invisible? Simple idea. Invisible. What? Real like? Yes, real. Let's have a hand of you, said Mr. Marvel. If you are real, it would be so darn out of the way like. Then, Lord, he said, how you made me jump, gripping me like that. He felt the hand that had closed round his wrist with his disengaged fingers, and his fingers went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest, and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. I'm dashed, he said. If this don't be cockfighting, most remarkable. And there I can see a rabbit clean through you, half a mile away. Not a bit of you visible except... He scrutinized the apparently empty space keenly. You've been, you haven't been eating bread and cheese, he asked, holding the invisible arm. You're quite right, and it's not quite assimilated into the system. Ah, said Mr. Marvel. Sort of ghostly, though. Of course, all this isn't half so wonderful as you think. It's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants, said Thomas Marvel. How dare you manage it? How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story, and besides, I tell you, the whole business fairly beats me, said Mr. Marvel. What I want to say at present is this. I need help. I have come to that. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered, and I saw you. Lord, said Mr. Marvel. I came up behind you, hesitated. Went on. Mr. Marvel's expression was eloquent. Then stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. So I turned back and came to you. You and... Lord, said Mr. Marvel. But I'm all in a tizzy. May I ask? How is it? And what you may be requiring in the way of help? Invisible. I want you to help me get clothes and shelter, and then with other things. 
I've left them long enough. If you won't, well, but you will, must. Look here, said Mr. Mark. I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about any more, and leave me go. I must get steady a bit, and you've pretty near broken my toe. It's all so unreasonable. Empty downs, empty sky, nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature. And then comes a voice, a voice out of heaven, and stones, and a fist. Lord, pull yourself together, said the voice, for you have to do the job I've chosen for you. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were round. I've chosen you, said the voice. You're the only man except some of those fools down there who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power. He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you, he paused and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you. I don't want to betray you, said Mr. Marvel, edging away from the direction of the fingers. Don't you go a thinking, whatever you do. All I want to do is help you. Just tell me what I got to do. Lord, whatever you want done, that I'm most willing to do. Chapter 10 Mr. Marvel's Visit to Ipping After the first gusty panic had spent itself, Ipping became argumentative. Skepticism suddenly reared its head. Rather nervous skepticism, not at all assured of its back, but skepticism nevertheless. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air or felt the strength of his arm could be counted on the fingers of two hands. And of those, one of these witnesses, Mr. Wadgers was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house. And Mr. Jaffers was lying stunned in the parlor of the coach and horses. Great and strange ideas transcending experience often have less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Ipping was gay with bunting, and everybody was in, a ga was in gala dress, which Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon, even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion. On the supposition that he had gone away, he had quite gone away, and with the skeptics, he was already a jest. But people, and skeptics and believers alike, were remarkably sociable all that day. Heyman's meadow was a was a gay with a tent, in which Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea. While without, the Sunday school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs. Cuss and Sagbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air, but people for the most part had the sense to conceal whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green and an inclined strong rope, down which, clinging the while to a pulley swung handle, one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other. Came in for considerable favor among the adolescents, as also did the swings and the coconut shies. There was also promenading, and the steam organ attached to a small roundabout filled the air with a pungent flavor of oil and with equally pungent music. Members of the club, who had attended church in the morning, were splendid in badges of pink and green. Some of the gayer-minded had also adorned their bowler hats with brilliant colored flavors of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose misconceptions of holiday-making were severe, was visible through the jasmine about his window or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look, 
poised delicately on a plank supported on two chairs, and whitewashing the ceiling of his front room. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.